In those days, in their thirst for water, the people grumbled against Moses, saying, Why did you ever make us leave Egypt? Was it just to have us die here of thirst with our children and our livestock? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? A little more and they will stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go over there in front of the people, along with some of the elders of Israel, holding in your hand as you go the staff with which you struck the river. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock in Horeb. Strike the rock, and the water will flow from it for the people to drink. This Moses did in the presence of the elders of Israel. The place was called Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled there and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord in our midst or not? The Word of the Lord. Our first reading for this Sunday is taken from the book of Exodus. Let us reflect on conversion. Conversion as a process, a process by which God meets His people over and over again, a God that does not get tired of reaching out to us, and we hope we could respond to Him also with equal zeal. That's the path of conversion. In the first reading, we see the people Israel already wandering in the desert. They have been freed from the clutches of slavery in Egypt. They had already seen the many miraculous interventions of God on their behalf. Then came this long, long period of uh, journeying in the desert before they could enter the Promised Land. Desert, dry, hot, lifeless. How did Israel, how did the people react to this uh, hardship in the desert? They got angry at Moses, the person chosen by God to lead them out of Egypt, the person who dealt with Pharaoh, the person who talked with God and communicated to the people God's messages. This Moses, in a way, got the full impact of the anger and the ire of the people due to their thirst. And look at how this thirst led the people to a forgetfulness. Forgetfulness of what God had done to them. All the good things that God had done were forgotten because they needed water. And even the humiliating experience of slavery in Egypt suddenly looked like paradise in comparison to their suffering in the desert. My dear brothers and sisters, sin in the Bible is often depicted as an act of forgetfulness, forgetting God, forgetting the goodness of God. And they started grumbling, and they even fought with one another, probably trying to outdo each other, you know, and uh, compete with one another uh, for the little water that they had. But in this context of forgetfulness, of grumbling, of fighting, and animosity, God enters as a compassionate, understanding God. God instructed Moses to use the same staff that had parted the waters of the sea so that the people could uh, cross the sea, to use the same staff to let water gush out of a rock. 
God does not get tired of saving His people. You know, if this were a human being, maybe the story would have changed. A human being would have felt also uh, hurt if his good deeds had been so easily forgotten by the people, but not God. God knows that these people are made of dust. God will understand. God will always do something to regain the people's confidence and to let people remember. Conversion is such a process, a process that becomes real because God does not get tired of loving us and forgiving us and reminding us of His presence in our lives. Conversion, hopefully, is a process which is also a response on our part, a process of remembering, never forgetting. And when we forget, to go back to the memories of the goodness of God to us and encountering God again in memory, we turn to Him. So, dear brothers and sisters, let us take the invitation of Lent seriously. Repent, be converted, remember how God has been good to you. Return to Him. Reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in hope of the glory of God. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For Christ, while we were still helpless, died at the appointed time for the ungodly. Indeed, only with difficulty does one die for a just person, though perhaps for a good person one might even find courage to die. But God proves His love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Word of the Lord Our second reading for this Sunday is taken from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. We are reflecting on conversion as a process, as God's turning to us in patience and love and understanding, and hopefully we, turning again and again to God. When we forget God and grumble and complain to God, let us remember. And remembering, we go back to God. This never-ending process, this never-ending journey in faith that always involves remembering, forgetting, remembering again, and all of these leading, hopefully, to an encounter, a fresh encounter with the Lord. That was the experience of the people Israel in the first reading. Oh, how easily they forgot God's goodness to them. When God liberated them from Egypt, when they encountered the lack of water. But then God is good and patient. And by using, by making uh, Moses use the same staff, that parted the water to allow water to gush off forth from a rock, then God was actually telling the people, do you remember? Do you remember what this staff has done for you? And then the people went back to God. In the second reading, St. Paul, in a more theological manner, 
describes to us the process of conversion, primarily as God's action in our lives, involving our response. He begins with faith, the theological virtue of faith. By faith, according to him, we have been restored in our relationship with God. We have again begun to enjoy peace with God. Of course, it is God's initiative in Jesus, making us just again. What is our response? Faith, believing in the one sent by God. And by faith, we are justified. We are made just before God. Our relationship with God has been restored. That's the beginning. Now, we know for a fact, all of us here, we can claim, oh, we are people of faith. But once in a while, in fact, according to the Bible, even the righteous person sins seven times a day. So even with faith, we can fall. Even with faith, we can forget. Even with faith, we can turn away from God. So, what happens? What happens? St. Paul talks about hope. Aha! Faith needs hope so that we could continue journeying, believing that God can be relied on, that God continues to offer a bright future for us. There is a promised glory. And this is an incentive for us to keep on journeying. When we fail, when we fall, let us not lose hope. Part of conversion is believing that God will still be there. God does not revoke His offer of love and grace. So, hope leads us also to conversion. But some people will say, how do I know that I can truly hope? Is this not wishful thinking? How do I know that I can rely on God you know, in the virtue called hope? Now, St. Paul has an answer to that. He says, we can hope in God because He has poured love into our hearts. Remember how much God loves you. While we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. That's how much God loves us. Remembering the love of God, we know that our hope is not empty. We know that what we believe in, in faith, is true and sure. This is the dynamics of conversion. Believing, hoping, and we can hope because we have experienced being loved by God. Faith, hope, and love. So, dear brothers and sisters, those theological virtues are the very dynamism of God's grace and our response in the whole life of conversion. We continue believing, but when we fall, let us continue hoping. And when we are tempted to doubt that there is hope for us, remember how much we have been loved. And remembering that our faith will be nourished again and our hope will be enlivened. Our Gospel passage on this third Sunday of Lent is taken from St. John, the story of the encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well in Sikar, which is Samarian territory. We have been reflecting on the process of conversion, a process of God turning to us in patience and love, and hopefully we turning to God also by constantly remembering how much He loves us. In the first reading from Exodus, 
the people Israel, upon experiencing thirst and dryness in the desert, suddenly grumbled and got angry at Moses. They have forgotten God's goodness to them. But God was patient and kind, and God gave them water, using the same staff of Moses that parted the waters. And this time, the same staff is used to allow water to come forth from a rock. So, the same staff is some sort of a remembering, telling the people, do you remember how much I cared for you? Do not forget. This is conversion. God patiently journeying with us in our forgetfulness, reminding us and the people turning again to God. In the second reading from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, we see the process of conversion using the three theological virtues. Faith, which enables us by God's grace to correct our relationship with God we will become just again in the, in the eyes of God. But then when we fall, in spite of our faith, there is hope. The hope of glory, the hope of salvation. So we should not uh, wallow in frustration and hopelessness. But how, how reliable is our hope? How do we know that God really really continues to offer love to us, then remember His love. Remember how much God has loved us, especially through and in Jesus Christ. So through the three virtues, faith, hope, and love, there is a constant impetus for us to turn to God who constantly offers His life to us. In a narrative form, the encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman can be a description of some key moments of what we call the process of conversion. Let me indicate three. The first is Jesus waiting, as it were, for the woman in the well. A conversion story happens or starts with Jesus' initiative. Jesus is there as though waiting for us to encounter us. Remember, Jesus got to the well before the woman got there. Jesus had already been there as though waiting for her to come. And look at the simplicity of the beginning of such an encounter. Jesus, a tired, thirsty traveler, just like his ancestors in the desert, begged the woman for water. An ordinary request. But as though telling the woman, you are important to me. You matter to me. In fact, I need you. You can give me something. Water. My dear brothers and sisters, not all conversion stories begin with something extraordinary. You know, the, we are familiar with the story of St. Paul, you know, on his way to Damascus and this blinding light and mysterious voice from heaven which uh, led to his fall from the uh, horse and his blindness. Well, that was Paul's experience. But in the experience of this woman, and maybe our experience, the beginning of conversion happens in very ordinary moments, ordinary times, ordinary places, as ordinary as a person asking us for water at the height of the heat of the sun at noon in a definite place, a simple place, a fountain, a well. My dear brothers and sisters, remember, try to remember where and how did the Lord encounter you. Don't look, as I said, for earth-shaking experiences. Maybe the call to conversion 
comes to us or has come to us in very ordinary, quiet events. Now the second stage. They started with water. The conversation centered on water. And then Jesus started talking about a different type of water. Life-giving water that will well forth from the heart of a person. And this caught the curiosity of this woman. The curiosity of this woman had already begun when Jesus asked for water. A Jew asking a Samaritan woman for water. And then came this strange language of living water, not found in any well, but found in the heart. And the giver is Jesus. And then Jesus tells the truth about this woman. Yes, the man you are living with is not your husband. In fact, you have had five. So this is your sixth woman. And this woman was suddenly amazed. Who are you? Are you the prophet? Why do you know me? Why do you know the truth about me? Yet probably the woman also, for the first time, encounters a man who knows the truth about her life, but does not condemn her. This man respects her. This man is compassionate towards her. This is the second stage of the woman's experience of conversion. God coming to her life as truth, but truth in love. Not truth that wants to destroy her, but truth that is love. And her eyes were open. Are you the Messiah? The recognition of God's presence in Jesus because he is the bearer of truth and love. My dear brothers and sisters, try to recall the times when we felt this deep love coming to us in spite of the truth of our sinfulness and frailty. I'm sure all of us have had such an experience when we were embraced and not condemned, when we were given hope, using the terminology of St. Paul in the second reading. That's a special encounter with God. And hopefully we could respond in the process called conversion. And the third moment, after this wonderful experience of being loved in the truth about myself, the woman becomes a missionary. She goes around the town telling people about Jesus. This is the peak of conversion. I do not encounter the Lord only for my own sake. I do not get to, to know the Lord and become close to the Lord and then I am brought back to my shell. No. The height of conversion is mission. If I had been drawn by the Lord to His heart, I should draw close to people and bring the truth and love of Jesus to others. This is the third uh, item that I want to propose. So, first, the simplicity of encountering the Lord. And let us be aware that every moment can be a potential encounter with God, calling us to a change of heart. Secondly, Jesus encounters us as truth and love. We have nothing to fear. Let us allow Him to enter our hearts, our sinful past. He wants to enter because He loves us. And third, having encountered Him, go. Be a bearer of the good news. Let other people know Jesus and His love and truth. Let me close this sharing by reminding all of us of one of the first statements of Pope Francis, whose 
first anniversary as Pope we just celebrated. He said in one of his first Sunday Angelus messages, he said, God does not get tired of forgiving us. God does not get tired of running after us, encountering us to offer us new life. We are the ones who get tired coming to Him in order to ask for forgiveness. My dear brothers and sisters, as we thank God for the gift of Pope Francis, let us take to heart His Word, which is, in a way, a reflection on the readings of today. Let us not be afraid of the call to conversion. God is there, tenderly present to us, reminding us of His love, of His mercy. Let us not get tired coming to Him. The Word has been exposed. Let us now fulfill it.